कॉम्बिनेशन ऑफ एमसीक्यू अच्छा इट मे बी ए कॉम्बिनेशन बट इट्स नॉट येट आई मीन इट इट मस्ट बी लाइक गोल गुआना प्रोजेक्ट ओके सो we can uh, wait for another 2 3 minutes for entry of the learners mama uh, do you have any presentation or uh, you'll uh, directly do it no i do it because you know actually i don't get time and this was told in the this thing no so i'll just do it like that because okay. i think i have time okay. presentation no no issue ma'am no issue and uh, i can uh, as you most of you have prepared the assignment you have gone through the mpa 007 you can directly even ask uh, your queries in the la last of the session with ma'am you can discuss those queries okay now ma'am uh, i think we can start okay 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 welcome everybody to this counseling session uh today we'll be taking up four units unit 5 6 7 and 8 so did any one of you go through the material or the go did you go through the last four units that we did did you have time is today a holiday for you no ma'am it's not a holiday okay it's not a holiday only one day okay so today now we'll start with the fifth unit that is parameters of vulnerability it is titled the parameters of vulnerability this course on reconstruction rehabilitation and recovery like when we talk of disaster management the most important thing is the concept of vulnerability can anybody in simple terms say what is vulnerability what do you understand by vulnerability i am the vulnerable the sense to which one is susceptible to something that to happen to him a degree yeah. or an extent to which someone is susceptible for something yeah. to or happen to him disease or yeah. disaster so vulnerability as you said it is something that one is exposed to or likely to be you know uh likely to be impacted by the disasters so before we understand what vulnerability is so like for example generally we say that in disasters who are the most vulnerable when we talk of vulnerability who are the most vulnerable the, the poor and, and the, children yeah poor and the marginalized sections of the society in any country so because why why are they vulnerable because their ability to face the disaster and to recover from the disaster shocks is the lowest because they do not have the capacity and the capability to such an extent they are able to face the disasters that's why we say they are vulnerable okay you all remember that when the covid pandemic reigned supreme like it swept across all the countries the most vulnerable were the poor the marginalized and even amongst the other sections of the society those who had certain problems health issues so they were all exposed to that pandemic so that is what vulnerability is so 
they get exposed to these disasters, which cause loss of livelihood, damage to property and various resources. Before we understand or talk about vulnerability, we need to know what a hazard is, hazard and a disaster. Now you have come to the last lag of the program. So you must be knowing what do you understand by hazard? Tell me. What is a hazard? Okay. My own understanding, hazard is anything that um, can cause harm to, to people or environment. Yeah. Hazard is an impending disaster. Like it has not yet become the disaster, but there is a danger. As you said, there is a danger. So it can be human imposed or it can be natural also, but it has the capacity and the potential to create a losses. Like for example, there is a building and the wiring of the building, it's so poor that it can pose a hazard. Yeah. Tell me, Adam. Okay. Um, well, according to my own understanding, hazard is a natural or a human-made event that threatening or adversely affects human life, property, or activity to an extent of causing a disaster. Yeah, hazard is something, a danger that is in waiting. It mm. may not happen. It may not, like, for example, somebody has built a house or something, a building is built on a, in an area that is prone to landslides. Okay. So there's always a danger that is lurking, that something may happen, isn't it? It may not happen also, but they are in a hazardous area. That's why I said in the homes, like we don't see the, whether the wiring is okay or not. In buildings, we don't, it is not proper inspection is not done to see if the wiring is proper or not. One continues like that, that it can be, a, it can pose as a hazard. In your countries, don't these fire hazards, do they, don't they take place, the fire disasters? Like in India, it does take they place. They do take place. Ah, we know that there is a hazard. There is an impending, there is some danger that could, it could turn into a disaster. Not necessary that it becomes a disaster, but a situation can turn into a disaster. That is the hazard. So a hazard involves an element of risk. That's what I said. It has a risk element, which can cause loss of life and property. So risk, like I am exposed, like for example, COVID. I go out during COVID, suppose had I gone out without putting on the mask, then there was always a danger of my getting exposed, isn't it? So there is a risk involved. So that risk precipitates or pushes the hazard. So the hazard finally may turn into a disaster. So vulnerability means that the community, the society, the system, when they get exposed to these hazards and they are vulnerable, we say that they are vulnerable. So anything may happen and they may get exposed to this. For example, in disasters, you must have say, read about rapid onset disasters and slow onset. Have you have you read about it in the first two courses, rapid and slow? Yes, ma. Now, rapid, what is the example of a slow disaster? Slow disaster is like a drought. It took time good. before it occurred. Yeah, yeah, very good. So it is a slow drought is an example of a slow onset disaster. Slowly, it may lead to impoverishment, loss of livelihood, like, you know, the crops not giving the yield, migration, all these things. So this is why the people get vulnerable. Like, for example, in 2004, the tsunami that happened, it impacted the South Asia region in a very, very bad way, in a very, very extreme manner. So when disaster management, when we talk of disaster management, it is very important to understand the issue of vulnerability, especially because of certain factors. First is 
there are certain practices or the activities that take place in many countries which lead to increased vulnerability. We all know that many a times the government or any other body, like generally we don't, we are not uh, that proactive. We are always mostly reactive. So proactive means preparedness, mitigation. Reactive is response. So generally why disasters are taking place, though it may have slightly come down, why it is taking place is there are certain practices and the activities that are generally carried on without paying much attention to the seriousness of it. And the other important thing is managing disasters require a lot of resources. Okay, financial, manpower, many things, many resources. So many countries are grappling with this shortage of resources. That's why the issue of vulnerability is assuming increasing proportion. So more and more people are getting vulnerable and we are unable to deal with this aspect. So what are the reasons? Now we come to the reasons of vulnerability. First is rapid population growth. We all agree that in any country, increasing population leads to depletion of resources because there is a lot of demand that is placed on the resources. So very few resources get allocated to disaster management. So rap because there are other issues that we need to you know, look into when the population is increasing, their health, education, all these becomes important. So the money or the budget that is allocated to disaster management activities, it gets lessened. So basically, rapid population growth is a major factor. The second is environmental degradation. What is environmental degradation? Tell me. That is when the land is, be, is not being used according to the law, illegal minings, kind of uh, illegal activities on the land that lead to the destruction of that land. Yeah, good. Deforestation, over cultivation, mm. over grazing, then poor land use. All this also makes the land more prone to disasters like floods, landslides, etc. Then third is increased rate of industrialization and rapid urbanization. Industrialization also, it leads to many issues. And urbanization, when the urban areas grow in such a manner that, you know, we don't give importance to several things, that also leads to, like I said, mushrooming of buildings. You know, when the buildings are built in such a way that, there is no adherence to building codes, whether the area is, you know, proper licenses, proper approvals are taken. So this also happens. So increased rate of industrialization and rapid urbanization without safety measures. So everything goes out without taking any safety measures. See, whenever safety measures are compromised, disasters are bound to happen. I think you all agree. Safety is the key important consideration. Then with all these the impoverished conditions, like, you know, the conditions in which I mean some, like, you know, the conditions in which the people live, especially when there is rapid urbanization without access to basic amenities. Then gender inequalities. See, in disasters, you all agree that women are the most who are most affected. Don't you think? Everybody is affected. Women tend to get affected more. Don't you think? Yes, yes I agree. Right. Yeah, agree. Uh, what way? You just tell me. You, you, you relate it to your country. Like, for example, in India, I can say, like, you know, women have to walk so many miles to get the firewood. Okay? And also... Other things, when there is scarcity of resources, food especially, you know, the women get the little to eat. And the pregnant mothers, lactating mothers, 
they get very badly affected by when disasters happen and there are no many a times there are no proper facilities yes mr sam yes um in south sudan one hmm. of the sensitive area is decision making especially hmm. if it comes to scenarios where people need to get evacuated sometimes you know the, mm. the men tend to detect and women should follow actually what they say in terms of decision making mm. yeah and also decision in terms of use of other resources family resources are also detected by men yeah. Over. so gender vulnerable like you know gender inequalities so that is another important and war and civil strife i think you are from sudan so you know it very are you in where in which place are you in sudan currently i'm in juba how is the situation there uh it's fine quietly fairly good okay <laughs> yes so war and civil strife also leads to situations and also other thing is which are which is a vulnerability factor is lack of public access information and awareness see many a times the public do not know the people the common person does not know what to do during when we talk about pre disaster during disaster post disaster phases like you know many a times they do not know what to do so there is lack of public awareness and information and due to this the preventive and preparedness measures are also the minimum and the other thing is when we talk of development the other day we discussed about the development issues whether they precipitate disasters or disasters precipitate development so there is no clarity about the policies at times when the policies are made they need to take a very holistic perspective in view so this is also one aspect which increases the vulnerability so i just want to recap so what are the factors that increase vulnerability rapid population growth environmental degradation increased rate of industrialization and urbanization then gender inequalities war and civil strife the lack of public awareness and information absence of preventive and preparedness measures and neglect of developmental issues and concerns so in order to deal with this thing of vulnerability what we need to do is one the, every country needs to have in place appropriate preparedness and mitigation measures mitigation the other day as i said is mitigation is something which stops which to a great extent stops it mitigates it lessens the impact of the disasters next we come to the types of vulnerability vulnerability also there are different types of vulnerability first is material or economic vulnerability can anybody say what is it because if this was this, this this is there in the other course material also can anybody say what is material vulnerability or economic vulnerability if any community country or people we say that they are economically vulnerable what do we mean by that well according to my own understanding if you say the country that are economically vulnerable is that when there is high inflation mm. of uh, good and services mm. and also people cannot access phones that is there is no soft loan there is no jobs available so people cannot cater for themselves for their basic amenities what to it is a problem so close of what to maintain other aspect of life Yeah, so they are economically is, vulnerable. Yeah, vulnerable. Material and economic vulnerability implies that they do not have access to resources. See, resources, especially the financial resources, their livelihood. As you said, they need to have job opportunities. Then only they'll be able to equip themselves and capacitate themselves to be economically strong. So this is one type of vulnerability. That is material or economic vulnerability. the next is social vulnerability what what is social vulnerability can anybody say um uh, if i could add something to it uh, it is yeah. it seems to be like a, a poor poor social protection from either government or any other 
uh, institution, like non-governmental organizations or foundations that used to give a uh, to, to to some affected vulnerable communities as well. Yeah, that is one. Social vulnerability. And also, we have social institutions in the society, don't you think? Family, community. At times, if they disintegrate, then the structures disintegrate. This also makes them more vulnerable socially. So that is so, yeah, somebody, Adamu. Yeah. Yes, these are uh, social vulnerability. We are talking about uh, single parents, mm. uh, yeah. widows, divorcee with children who is left with so many children. A woman with like five, six children who had to cut out for them and things like that. Very good. So this is also like what earlier it was said. That is also social vulnerability, like where they do not have access to you know social security mechanisms all the insurance policies that is also social vulnerability and as you said the disintegration of social institutions like you know single parents widow widows and uh, all these things also increases the vulnerability when, the, when there is disintegration of the social structures they become more vulnerable there is nobody to give them the protection the next is ecological or environmental vulnerability. This is also a type of vulnerability. What is ecological vulnerability? Tell me. Just like, uh, for example, if um, you, you are located or you re you resettle or you settle in areas or geographical locations that have uh, like. Uh, hills or mountains that you can be front to landslides or if you reside along the coast of the oceans where you will have uh, some risk of some of these disasters like tsunamis and so on over yeah that is ecological vulnerability where there is environmental degradation in several ways yes adam Yes, like uh, building a house uh, in the volcano active areas, uh, mountains area where there is uh, chances of landslide or ice and uh, snow slide and things like that. Yeah, and this Salisu, you want to say something? I think you have raised a query. Can you hear me? Okay. If you have anything, then you can unmute yourself. Uh -huh. Tell, unmute and speak. So, ecological vulnerability. Yeah, you want to say? Yes, I want to say what. Uh -huh. Yeah, like you said, ecologically, like biotic factors and abiotic factors. Mm. Ecological affect both animals and Living matters and non living matters. Now, what I want to say that the benefits. Yeah, which country you are? Nigeria. Achha. What about the envir environmental degradation, like that problem in your country? Hello? No, can you tell me about the environmental degradation problem in your country or in your place where you reside? You have this problem for oh, by ecological, yeah, I mean, ecological, yeah. Ah, for example, Italy. drought. Hmm. Yeah, it may affect the both biotic, uh, biotic and abiotic factors in the in some areas in Nigeria also. Okay, are there in proper environmental laws? Yeah, it led to loss of some lives of animals. At times, in the place where they didn't have water to survive, they don't have balls, they don't have uh, uh, main source of water. So it okay. may lead to lose their lives. Okay. Yeah, Adamu? Yes, yes, ma. The environmental degradation issues that we do have in Nigeria, 
more especially in the northeastern part, is uh, the issue of deforestation. Hello? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah the, the issue of deforestation, people are cutting trees, using as a mean of, 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 of source of energy without replacing, and that led to the desertification encroachment to the area. And uh, also, uh, poor use of drainages, which used to flooding, the area is always flown to the flood. Okay. And uh, also the issue of overgrazing, because there is issues between uh, herders and the farmers. Yeah, so the area where the 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 the, the herders used to be is being overgrazed. Mm -hmm. And also contribute to some disasters. Good, Sal Salim. You had raised. Um, Adam, I have said it. <laughs> okay, so we yeah, so environmental degradation is one. Then the other is organizational vulnerability, like we discussed material or economic vulnerability, social vulnerability, environmental vulnerability, and the other type of vulnerability is organizational vulnerability, where there is. To manage disasters, we need to have strong central, state, regional, and the grassroots level organizational structures in any country. Then only the management of disasters becomes effective. So at times, the organizational organizations are there. They are unable to work, or they do not have manpower. They do not have resources. So lack of strong central state and grassroots organizations also is organizational vulnerability so any other thing you want to add for organizational vulnerability so the organizations have to be strong because each country has many of the country yeah yeah the yeah, oh, this organizational institution is, uh, I think they are vulnerable if they don't have enough resources and the mom power to carry out their responsibilities. Okay. And like the other time I was saying, uh, the structures that are talking about the national, the regional, the state, and the local um, community, in the, uh, sorry, disaster authorities that are supposed to act during the disaster. You know, by law, they are there, but physically, if you come down to the community level, you cannot identify the office of these disaster management people and even to find them and get data or things like that. Yeah. So there, there has to be a proper coordination from top to bottom. See, it always has to flow from bottom up. Like that's why we the other day we spoke about community-based disaster management also. So wherever a disaster occurs, the community has to come together, the grassroots organizations at the village level, at the district level, wherever it is they have, but they need to get the support from above. So whatever the money, other resources they need to get. So organizational vulnerability is also an important thing. Next is educational vulnerability. Like we have been talking that lack of public awareness and education. So many a times people are not aware as to how to, because many a times, you know, we have certain, we all have uh, certain beliefs, like, you know, some cultural beliefs, we all have, there's nothing wrong in it. So that along with, we call it traditional wisdom. Okay. There is nothing wrong that we go by the traditional wisdom, but along with traditional wisdom, we need to apply proper knowledge and information in managing the disasters. Don't you think? In your countries, you have any this thing of traditional wisdom whenever disasters take place or, you know, in a like, you know, they say people generally see the movement of the clouds and they associate certain things with barking of dogs, something like that. Do you have any such thing? Can you give yes. any example? Yes, we do have such beliefs. Ella? Yeah. You yes, have? They, they, yes, they will tell you when you had a dog is biking, then there is someone around or there is a spirit around. Hmm. Or when you had a donkey, 
uh, crying, there's a button is bound to happen. Achha, okay. Yeah, yeah. So that's a, that's a pretty based on tradition. There is nothing wrong in it. So there's nothing wrong in getting prepared also if one feels that, you know, there is some there are some signs that nature is giving. So this along with awareness, this only says that something is going to happen. Okay. So, but how to face it? A disaster is going to happen. A flood is going to come. A cyclone is going to come. How to face it? That the proper education and awareness helps one to tackle it. So, along with this tradition, faith in beliefs and customs, we need to have proper information and knowledge to handle the disasters. So, another type of motivation is attitudinal vulnerability. Attitudinal is where there is low public awareness. That is also called attitudinal vulnerability. The awareness is not much. Then physical awareness, vulnerability. Physical vulnerability is where the buildings and all are built without adherence to any proper laws, codes, building codes, all this. This leads to physical vulnerability. And finally, political vulnerability. Political vulnerability is not all have access to political power and representation. This is always very limited. So, see, when we talk of disasters, the community, we say, has to play an important role. But the community can play provided it has some access to political power and representation. So that is very important. So people also, many countries, they get affected because there is political vulnerability. So these are the different types of vulnerability. Firstly, economic vulnerability, social vulnerability, ecological vulnerability, organizational vulnerability, educational vulnerability, attitudinal vulnerability, physical vulnerability, and political vulnerability. So all these things put together, they many a times impact the people and then they are not able to face the disasters. They get exposed to this. So one needs to work on these. The mitigation measures also have to focus on these concerns. The planners in the government who are responsible for setting priorities also need to take, keep these in view and formulate the policies and plans. So now we sum up the thing. We, we just now discussed in this unit the concept of vulnerability. What are the parameters or factors of vulnerability which includes population, poverty, fragile ecosystem. The ecosystem is very fragile. What is fragile is, for example, areas which are prone to floods, landslides, environmental degradation. We, now, we just now discussed the environmental vulnerability. So all this makes the ecosystem very fragile and that it gets affected. Then gender. And at times, there is nothing wrong in adhering to traditional structures and practices. As I said, these blended with information and knowledge will help the people. And neglect of development issues and concerns. So these are the broad areas parameters of vulnerability and types of vulnerability. So now we just recapitulate what are the phases of disaster management cycle. In this, there is a reference to as a recapitulating, what is the, what are the various phases of disaster management cycle? So disaster management cycle, first there is an alert, then preparedness, prevention, mitigation, response, and rehabilitation. So this is a cycle. So all these activities have to follow to ensure proper disaster management. So, for example, when we talk about this vulnerability, like what are the various things like when we say that people are vulnerable, how do we say? For example, when, the, when there are settlements built on steep slopes, softer soils, cliff tops, then some houses or buildings are built near the streams, near the mountain. So there people are vulnerable. 
then roads and communication lines in mountainous areas see many a times in india also you must have read that during monsoons or other things some of these places they get affected and there are sudden landslides and people get stranded so these places are vulnerable then buildings with weak foundation there are even instances where the buildings collapse because they have weak foundation then there is also inadequate monitoring warning and evaluation systems so how can these vulnerabilities can be reduced or mitigated see there should be proper land use planning and there should be hazard mapping what is hazard mapping anybody say what is hazard yeah uh, yes what is what is hazard mapping that is to identify those areas that are vulnerable or prone so then you give them a code um mark them using a code that is coding yeah this is hazard mapping like you know through various techniques the mapping of the area is done so that at least we come to know which areas are more hazardous and then appropriate steps can be taken so this is one way that we can tackle vulnerability then land use regulations see in every place the land use is just the land is used by various stakeholders for various purposes but that should not be the appropriate laying down of rules and regulations for proper land use should be done so land use regulations then and also some of the activities that we can take that can be take place for example is there should be proper forest management program it should be a very participatory these are the way now we are discussing the various ways through which vulnerability can be reduced like for example we talk of tsunami okay let us take an example tsunami in tsunami what we can do like we can have forest management program then we can have re, we can have good regenerating methods of fisheries and we can also have a proper code for coastal management then we can systematize the vulnerability mapping of the area so in a similar way we need to do for all the disasters for drought like you know for drought see that how water various traditional water harvesting techniques can be done in the area and what are the alternate cropping patterns that we can think of and alternate livelihood programs suppose we know that some area is drought prone and nothing can be done but we can think of alternate livelihood programs so this way the vulnerability can be reduced so we need to have when when we talk of vulnerability what we need to have is we should have a sustainable livelihood see whenever disasters take place which type of disaster or whatever it is the most what which is the most this thing that it gets affected is livelihood see people lose their livelihood so we should have a sustainable livelihood program now many countries are coming up with sustainable livelihood program where depending on the area which is exposed to the hazard or a disaster alternate arrangements can be worked like for example we can have food for work program like there is a drought prone area there the people the agriculturists can be utilized their services can be utilized in works in other works and then with that they can get food so because you know because of this especially drought whenever there is a drought or the area is prone to drought many farmers migrate to cities they leave everything and migrate to cities they even sell their cattle and other you know this thing livestock and they go to cities in search of jobs but very few jobs are available i'm sure in your countries also it happens isn't it the migration it does happen Smart. because yeah because livelihood gets affected yeah tells 
so we need to have we need to develop each country the government in each country has to have a framework of sustainable livelihood so livelihood creation of there should be several options for creation of livelihood so then only we will be able to give them a sustainable livelihood and also enable them to become more self reliant see people are not just beneficiaries they have to be integrated in the development process i think you all agree that it's not that they are just working they are also they have their own rights we have a rights based approach they have their own rights so they have to be a part of the development process they can't be treated in isolation so we need to have a sustainable livelihood framework in which the community the government and other sectors need to participate and then formulate a appropriate policy which is in many countries this is a very neglected concern i'm sure in many of your countries also do you don't you think that there is need for sustainable livelihood framework any framework the livelihood yeah because livelihood is really important for persons sustenance see they need to work and then you know then only they can support themselves and the family don't you think so sustainable livelihood is very very important when we talk of vulnerability so now in unit 5 till now we have discussed we have completed unit 5 we have discussed the concept of vulnerability risk and how hazard how these are linked to vulnerability what are the factors that promote vulnerability or increase the vulnerability what are the various types of vulnerability and what are the factors that promote vulnerability and what are the various measures that can be taken to reduce vulnerability and finally the need to have a sustainable livelihood framework the livelihood has to be very sustainable many international organizations also have formulated several guidelines for having a sustainable livelihood framework but ultimately what happens is it is for the government concern to take it into account and formulate appropriate framework okay any doubts anything on this then we take a 5 minute break and go to unit 6 okay we'll continue now with the unit number 6 unit number 6 deals with development of physical and economic infrastructure we are talking of now reconstruction and rehabilitation so when we talk of rehabilitation the infrastructure is very important what do you understand by infrastructure what do you, what is infrastructure in simple terms what do you mean by infrastructure when we say so infrastructure simply means buildings how these schools hospitals and roads yeah good so infrastructure is the basic internal structures the physical structures that can be seen 
yeah. pragmatic yeah. aspects of the development. Because these are basic or these are these are needed for the development of the country. So this is the basic internal structure or the foundation, which includes buildings, means of transportation, communication, hospitals, schools, all this. So in this also one of there are different types of infrastructure. First is physical infrastructure. What is physical infrastructure? Tell me. Like school, roads. The one yeah. that you can see that physical infrastructure. Yeah, water, sanitation, all these comes under physical infrastructure that have physical presence. Physical and tangible. Physical and tangible. Yeah. Yes, yeah, physical good. and tangible, exactly. Good, good. That you so can these are all physical. Oh, this is something, really. So this is physical infrastructure. Then what is what do you understand by social infrastructure? Social infrastructure. Like social education infrastructure. and health services. Yeah. More, more like cultural, cultural, cultural activities. Hotel. Like the social group. Like the social group. Yeah. Yeah. All these good. All okay. these. Along with uh, yeah. Areas, yeah, all this along with the community, the strong community, community based organizations, NGOs, voluntary organizations, and old age homes, community centers. So, that is also an infrastructure. Then, environmental infrastructure. Environmental infrastructure, which is needed for strengthening of the environment, proper laws, rules, regulations, bodies that can, you know, handle the problem of environmental degradation. All this comes under environmental infrastructure. So these are the types of infrastructures. So how can we develop the first the development of infrastructure is very, very important. So when we talk of development of infrastructure, what do you think is important? How can the infrastructure be developed? How can and whose role it is in development of infrastructure? Hmm? So especially government and, uh, and, uh, from, from and, the, and, and the people and, of the society. Yeah, now the people of the, the people of the society, that yes. means the community. Mm, community. The community, the community that live in the environment. I okay, yeah. I mean the people that live in the environment. Mm. Yes, true. And then when we talk of development of infrastructure, we also have to pay attention to building local capacities. See the capacity training of semi-skilled construction workers, masons, youth in the villages. We need to build their local capacities. And other thing is we also should think of alternative technologies of building. See, when we start talk about physical infrastructure, building of buildings and all, we should also think about alternative ways for reconstruction. It's not the age old thing with which we are building the buildings, but even new technologies which are coming. These also have to be taken into consideration. And, yeah. and the other thing is the local communities have to be involved in all this building of infrastructure. No doubt the government has a role and responsibility in giving the infrastructure. But when we talk of rebuilding, reconstruction, the community has to be and we need to, the concerned government at the local level has to come up with plans where they are able to build the local capacities. Don't you think that local capacities have to be built? Don't you think? 
Uh, yes, local capacity it take a role before government in, enter into the uh, infrastructure matters. So the local people have knowledge, like which type of technology suits their conditions in the local areas. So they are able to contribute more in building the infrastructure. So we need to build the local capacities and also alternative technologies for promotion of or building of infrastructure. Like for example, we can have proper earthquake and cyclone resistant technology. Yeah, Jaya Joseph. Um, one uh, one um, disadvantage or like um, an impediment towards infrastructure development is corruption. Because basically, even if there are funds allocated for like a developmental project, if the impl impl implementation personnel or partners are involved into dubious like, like a tier in enterprise, I'm sure the project will be a failure. And if it's a failure, surely the intended purpose of that project will be non null and void. Yeah, I agree with you. But um, yeah, that is that is there. But then what is the way out? Like, don't you think that people have voice to raise these concerns? You have local bodies. Corruption is a main is a bigger issue. I know it. Like, you know, in many countries, including India, that's not a that is a common problem that all countries face. But then the voice of the people reigns supreme, don't you think? Are there ways in which they can raise their voice through their organization? Yeah, um, yes, ma'am. Agree, the um, or like, uh, agree. Always taking into consideration. It's an able government to implement people's policies. Yeah, you have um, some grassroots uh, um, in your organizations in your countries where the elected representatives of the people are there and they can raise voice. Hello? Yeah, uh, Hello, for my... Okay. Yeah. Don't you think that they can have their, they can raise voice? Um, from, my point, from my point is that um, there are always, um, especially in some areas of the world, there are some access barrier. Even if you've got a pressure group, they just um, go with, uh, to a certain point with uh, a barrier that will prevent them for their message or like their complaint to reach the appropriate authorities. Because obviously, in this type of enterprise, uh, people always try to be very crafty for their actions not to be exposed. But like as we see, um, one way that um, that can be sorted out is by the, um, the NGOs or like um, the, the NGOs or like whatever good will initiative uh, and also the about um, have um, proper strategies in place for performance management, which involves uh, monitoring and, and evaluations and, and external audits also. Okay. If I were to add, uh, yeah, uh, I would relate it to to vulnerability, like education vulnerability. If we upscale education vulnerability and people become aware, the local people, because they are the ones that are at the center of the hazard uh, impact. And so if we raise the awareness, we raise the level of education on the local people, then they will be able to demand and be able to build a yeah, hazard resistant infrastructure. Yeah. That, that, that will be able to stand even in the midst of, 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 of a strong hazard. So it stems from, first of all, having a well-informed community. And when the community is well-informed, then we are we have halfway solved the problem uh, of even corruption because they are the ones that would demand the type of infrastructure they need in their area. 
they will participate in the development trajectory of their places and so it will be it it, it, will, it will be them that would demand that we need this because this is what is going to stand for the kind of uh the hazard that has been mapped in their area yeah that's true Thank good you. well said so all these are yeah joseph yeah um there was one of uh, my lecturers um um, um uh, had a, a popular saying for for you to be successful in whatever drive that you are on, um, one, by you knowing your half and also knowing the other's half. Basically, if you know your half, it's 50%. You know in another or access to, to the, the other half um, of whatever drive that you are uh, makes it uh, above 50% going towards 100%. So as we say, you um, a community can be well um, informed in a way, but like if they don't have um, a clear trajectory of um, access to the upper power, whatever that is actually being ruled about within that lower level should will always be at the lower level, and it will be difficult for it to be accessed. But basically, if there is that access between the top and bottom. I'm sure most of these corrupt practices uh, will be off. Yeah, that's true. As he said that when we improve the educational opportunities and things, people become aware and then they, they, they'll they be able to little make a little dent on the system. Like it, it takes time. Like for example, in India, we have something like Right to Information Act, where the people have the right to ask from any government body, any body, through a written application, where they ask information about the money that is spent, what was the expected outcome, whether it has achieved the particular body. It can be anything in a hospital education institution anything so it is a legislation and they have to give the information to the person who is asking about it so measures like this will definitely make an impact so all this in india this right to information legislation it all arose out of a mass movement that took place in a village long back where the people wanted to know in that village from the panchayat panchayat is a small elected body of the people, the people wanted to know how much money was spent in that village on development programs. When they did not get the sufficient information, then everything, they all got together. Then, of course, it was a mass movement. It did not come in one go. It was a mass movement. And then slowly it took years. And finally, the government came up with right to information legislation. So things like this tend to improve things. So as we were saying, so yeah, yeah, Joseph. Yeah, um, that is also similar in Sierra Leone because we have um, rights to information act, and um, there are some um, institutions that are actually being worked about uh, nationally all throughout the country for whatever information on some certain projects that are community based or district district level based. Uh, so that whatever things that are actually going about, they can access towards it. I'm sure it's similar to us also. Yeah. So these are the things that will, you know, build or develop. When we talk of physical, economic infrastructure, when we talk of attitudinal, educational vulnerability, all these things put together will help in development of different types of infrastructure. So this unit basically deals with various types of how to build the infrastructure pertaining it has examples pertaining to different uh, disasters like the basic thing is all this infrastructure it needs to be local specific like when we talk of reconstruction of houses in an area so the local conditions have to be taken into account and then only the houses have to be built like for example many international agencies they pitch in efforts, they bring in resources in building 
the physical infrastructure. But whenever it is done, the needs of the people in that area has to be taken into consideration and then only it will be acceptable to the people. So all these things make a, a lot of impact or they have a, an important role in reconstruction. And the other thing that we have to discuss is environmental infrastructure, how the environmental infrastructure is to be built. Like the locale of the place and then what are the environmental hazards that place is getting exposed to. All these have to be like, for example, in India, we have practices like water harvesting and then uh, afforestation and then use of traditional wisdom. Like, you know, the wells and all which, which were traditionally, which have gone dry, now they are being dug up and then we have step wells. All these things play an important role when we talk of building environmental infrastructure. Like when we talk of environment, there have been many, many conventions, environmental agreements in it, oh, globally. Like you see, there, there was a Basel Convention on movement of hazardous waste. There was convention on biological diversity, climate change. Then there was a convention to combat desertification. Then there was a Kyoto Protocol on climate change. All these things. So it is not that the efforts were may, are being or not being made. Efforts are being made on several fronts. But only thing is, it depends on the country's concern to see that these are implemented and the other important thing when we talk of development of physical and economic infrastructure is to have sustainable community development see community is a key institution so we need to make the community sustainable how we need to support or have sustainable agriculture the local businesses have to be protected the water resources in the area have to be protected and they need to have energy conservation initiatives. The energy is a very, very precious resource. So each community has to be helped in having energy conservation measures, then recycle building materials. See, everything recycling is a very important aspect now that is being taken place. Nothing is to be wasted. So recycling of building materials and also for fuel. Alternatives are also being thought about. Like now we have, you know, electric cars also coming up. So electricity. So instead, you know, to reduce the usage of diesel, petrol. So building a sustainable community is very, very important. So we need to identify the characteristics of the community and then build a sustainable community that can, you know, on its own is able to stand and then manage the disasters to a great, with the help, with a little help from the government and other agencies, but they should be able to pool in their resources and become sustainable. So all these things, even sustainable, building a sustainable community helps in having well-equipped infrastructure. They can work towards having well-equipped infrastructure in their areas and then develop vulnerability reduction strategies for specific disasters in their areas. So basically what we attempt to tell is the community is the first responder in any disaster situations. So whenever, wherever we talk of managing disasters, no doubt, we discuss about the role of the government in helping the community, but ultimately it is the community that has to work towards becoming a sustainable community. So development of a sustainable community is very, very important. We have examples globally where communities have come together and evolved their own strategies. I was going through net. There are many examples in Nigeria also where sustainable community initiatives are being taken up. Don't you think? Yes, ma'am. 
because the communities have to be made self sustaining see they have to pool in their own resources they should know their strengths and weaknesses so ultimately there's no point that one can blame the government for not giving so developing a sustainable community is very very important so now we have finished unit 6 where basically we talk about the types of physical and economic infrastructure and how to build this infrastructure and then certain conventions or the unit talks about some environmental conventions that were built and then how to develop a sustainable community which is very very important now we take a break of 10 5 minutes and then go to unit 7 so we'll go on to unit 7 which is creation of long term job opportunities and livelihood options what do you understand by livelihood then abu bakar then yes ma'am means of livelihood ha what is livelihood livelihood that is uh, material required for a person to be able to live in a given locality yeah it is required for the, for living yeah yes it is the means of employment opportunities it is work opportunities that is given to the person to support himself or herself so the literal meaning is existence of a employment or work opportunity or occupation for persons living in a area so this support it refers to 
the physical sustenance of individual. If I'm able to work, then only I'm able to sustain my family. So livelihood is a very important component for individual sustenance. And livelihood, especially when we talk in the context of disaster management, it is linked to creation of a sustainable environment. The environment has to be sustainable where the livelihood, whenever there is disrupted also, again, one comes back to the situation because it emphasizes on multi-sectoral coordination. As you all know that managing disasters, the challenges, everything related to it, it, it is not the responsibility of only one sector. So similarly, livelihood is also a very important component of it. Livelihood is needed to reduce poverty and also it has to take into account how there is a link between the development and the environment and it is not impacting the livelihood. Like for example, as we were saying, like any activities taking place in disastrous situations or disastrous conditions, they need to look at it that it is not impacting the livelihood. And the secondly, an important component is it has to be developed in a proper, the design and implementation of a sustainable livelihood program has to be developed properly. So one has to see how a sustainable development promotes a sustainable livelihood approach. It has to bring the government, civil society, donors, community-based organizations, everything to have a sustainable livelihood. Any livelihood that promotes quality of life, okay? The ultimate objective of livelihood is it has to promote quality of life. If I'm doing something, it has to promote quality of my life. So quality of life and enhancing the social and economic growth. All these things should be a part of the livelihood. So what are the steps that we need to keep into account or take cognizance of when we have this livelihood perspective. First, there should be a rational and planned growth of agriculture, industrial and other sectors. Everything, all the sectors have to be together. It's not that only one sector is giving or giving livelihood. It has to be a combination of several sectors. Then creation of appropriate employment opportunities. Then programs for youth, women and physically challenged. All these also have to be, the, the livelihood has to take into account. So then only it can be sustainable. Then promotion of skilled labor. We have to promote skills in the people. Don't you think skills are important? Don't you think skills are important? Yes, ma'am. They are very, very important, ma'am. So appropriate skills. In a particular area, what type of skills are needed? So each sector, the strategy has to be to lay down the different skills that are needed. And you integrate it in developing the livelihood program. So when we talk of developing a livelihood, proper, sustainable livelihood, what does it need first? Any country, any country it has to develop a sustainable livelihood. What does it need? First, it has to take help of or apply participatory research tools and methodologies to study the livelihood options. It's not that certain livelihood options may be suitable to your country and in a particular region. They may not be suitable to the other regions. So you need to apply these tools and techniques and see 
what type of livelihood options are needed. Then, secondly, you have to see whether there are proper institutional arrangements to give this livelihood. Okay, it is one thing is to say that these livelihood options are important. Other things say that whether there are arrangements where one can get jobs for this. And also see that is there a gap between the knowledge and the resources and the livelihood options? See, you, for example, you know that in a particular area, in a particular state, these type of livelihood options are very, very in demand. But the thing is, you should also see whether the citizens there, the people there, the youth there, they are properly equipped to capture this livelihood options. Then other thing is you have to take indigenous coping systems. Each place has some indigenous coping systems, which is peculiar to the area. So especially when we talk of disaster management, we are talking now relating these livelihood options with disasters. So we have to keep the indigenous coping systems in view and then see how these impact the disasters on different vulnerable groups and how the various we have to think of various ways how the knowledge and skills have to be improved and then we can create sustainable livelihood options so livelihood option is very very livelihood approach is very very important to reconstruction like for example any country, I think you, in any country, like uh, pastoralists, we say, they, they move from one place to another. So they, the giving livelihood to them is very, very important. Like, you know, it is a very neglected thing. So they are, so because they move from one place to other, that place, one place may be prone to drought, other place may be prone to cyclone, other place may be prone to landslide. So, you know, how to develop livelihood options because they are nomads. They are pastoralists. Some of them are nomads. They move from one country to the other. One place, sorry, in the country to the other. So, they can't be left alone. So, appropriate livelihood options have to be created. And also, they depend on their livelihood, on, on the livestock also. So, how do we use the livelihood? of the livestock of this and creating the livelihood. So these are the several issues that we need to take into account when we talk of developing a sustainable livelihood. So can any one of you say how can we develop a sustainable livelihood framework? How can we develop in your country? Take an example of your country. Yes, ma'am, by enacting law and the policies that will make it for any government to be able to sustain maybe the uh, process that uh, is started by one government to be continued by the subsequent government so that the process of development will be uh, sustained in a continuity or in a continual manner. Yeah, but then uh -huh, that's true. Yes. Any Any other? Yeah, I'm, um, I was looking at participation, uh, the local participation, and also um, to empower uh, the, the communities uh, so that they are able to uh, stand on their own, uh, not only relying from the government and from the aid, from foreign aid, so that they can be sustainable, uh, they can have sustainable uh, livelihood. Good, good. Adamu? Yeah, yes, ma. I think the, for to sustain their livelihood is much more than just giving them what to eat or what to drink at the moment, but rather to teach them and engage them on how to do it, get it by themselves. That is by giving them soft loan, training them on how to do simple uh, life sustainable activities like weaving and uh, other things like that, providing a bumper harvest seed for them 
you know giving them opportunity to have fertilizers at hand at a time and other things like that that to engage them so that they can you know when they are doing it by themselves they will sustain it but when you are giving it to them they will not value it Yeah. So the community has to be involved from the planning stage up to the implementation stage and local available resources should be used. Good. Good all your responses. I'm very happy that you know you participate and then you know it's quite interactive. So any like in just I'm saying that in your term and exam also anything any written thing it is always better that you relate it to your country because in the course material you may see that some of the examples are you know some are global examples are also there but then wherever possible that reflects your creativity okay and your understanding the theory whatever we are saying talking about is theory with few examples but you can relate it to your country specific thing that improves your knowledge and then your expression also okay so each country has to look at its own resources its own typology its own you know how it is placed and then develop its own so it's not an easy task so creating employment for any country it is not a easy task and it is a major challenge why is it a major challenge is there is also a problem of migration of people from rural to urban areas so this develops a sort of a imbalance in the supply and demand of job opportunities so this is a major challenge when any government has to draw up a sustainable livelihood and the other important thing is the disaster relief that is given to the people it doesn't create any long term employment opportunities so other thing is we have this problem of climate change which is affecting the globally so that is also is a major challenge when you drop livelihood option and also environmental degradation that is a major problem that any country faces in terms of scarcity of resources food water etc so creating a balanced development is a key aspect and when we are creating a balanced development creation of a sustainable livelihood option also becomes a key challenge so all these things have to be taken into account to integrate as i said earlier all these things involves a multi faceted approach and organ like you know intersectoral coordination it is not the responsibility of one government at one level so disasters as i was saying should be considered as an opportunity of development no doubt developments also lead to development projects lead to disasters but the key challenge before government is how to convert this this into an opportunity disasters into opportunity and in this creation of appropriate livelihood also becomes a sustainable livelihood also becomes an important aspect that needs to be taken into consideration so this unit basically deals about the creation of long term job opportunities and livelihood options because any opportunity livelihood which is created for a long term doesn't given doesn't give much results it has to give a sustenance to the community in creating a long term sustenance okay then we give we go to the unit number 8 that is the funding arrangements for reconstruction just a 5 minute break and we start this
Joanne, how are you? Joanne, how are you? What are you? Uba, how are you? Adamu. I'm all right. Brother, how are you? The iron lady in the house. You are welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we have we have a Zambian lady. I don't know if she's in uh, my show. Okay. Hi. Yeah, Mansa. How are you? She's there, Mansa. Good, good, good. We're grand. Wow, both ladies are around today. Yeah. This is fantastic. Oh, I, yeah, can see you and I can see you on. Uh -uh. The house is full now. Yeah, <laughs> I'm happy. <laughs> I can see John is in the car. But can't She's eating up here. Class. Wow. Come we share. <laughs> Yeah, this yes, apple is tantalizing. Yeah, <laughs> message, message section so that we can watch it. Yeah. <laughs> Where do we start so that we complete it? Yeah, sure. I'm sure. ready to start, ma'am. I'm waiting for you. Yeah. So the last unit for the today's counseling is funding arrangements. What is the most important aspect when you talk about disaster management in reconstruction? What is very important is funds. Funds is the physical funds. Okay. So the money that is needed. So we keep talking of various things like rehabilitation, reconstruction, development of infrastructure, everything. But what is needed for all this money that is needed because there is a sudden and violent disruption of the social system in disaster where everything is damaged. So schools, infrastructure, and also now you need permanent things to come up and restoration of the activities. So what is needed is mobilization of resources. How do we mobilize resources and how do we distribute these resources and see that they are utilized in a proper way. So for any disaster management activity, first we need to have, like for example, a disaster has happened, but then what is the priority? Which sectors need priority in that area? Because the money is limited. So an important thing that is to take place is having, we call it a feasibility study. In a feasibility study, we collect the data and to have a complete picture, what was the damage which happened in the area, like what is the priority, prioritize sectors that need to be reconstructed, what is the amount that is going to come up. So all this a feasibility study is done, which includes everything like, you know, what are the proposed activities to be taken up, how the buildings have to be built transportation, then water distribution system, all these things have to be seen. So a feasibility study is something which is to be taken, like even the food supply also, like how it is to be done, what are the various groups, is the is malnourishment a problem in that area, all these things have to be done when you talk of reconstruction. Now we are talking of reconstruction. Now funding arrangements like I'm not because, you know, in India, we have a different system where the central government at the national level, it has its own than the state government. I want you people to tell what is the uh, system in your country? Anybody can say. Are there any funds? Yeah, ma yes, ma'am. The, 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 the system we have in our country is uh, quite somehow similar to that of India. Hmm. Because I study my MPL in India. Mm. I've been in India, so I a little bit know your system. So we have a slight mm. difference what of is how it? the what governments are run. We mm. have the central government, which is the mm. federal government. Mm. The one in India, you call it central government. Yeah. One yeah. here in yeah. Nigeria, we call it federal government. Okay. We have the state government in India, and we too, we have the state government. 
Mm. We have the local government and we have the local government as well. Okay. Really. So how is the funds? How, how are the funds? Like any disaster happens, like how are the funds given? You have any yes, funding? Ma yes, ma'am. Uh, we have us, we have NEMA here, National Emergency Management, uh, uh, is it authority? That is, uh, it is the uh, federal government uh, agency that is responsible of taking care of all the disaster that happened in the country. Okay. So they have the state uh, in all. They have the uh, offices in all over the, the state in all over the federation. Okay. And uh, when maybe a disaster happen in the state, so their office in the state are going to take care of uh, the whatever happened in the state. And okay. uh, the office when when something happened within the state, the within the uh, in local government, so the state office is going to take over. Okay really okay this is in nigeria this is in nigeria ma okay adamu yes i am also from nigeria is just to throw more light on what you have said um, um actually as you have said at the federal level we have what we call a NEMA, national emergency management agency which is under Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs and Disaster Management. Mm. Uh, the vice president of the country is the chairman of that committee mm. at that level. And we also have a SEMA, State Emergency Management uh, Agency, and we also have LEMA, Local Emergency Management, okay. which is chaired by the vice chairman. So the funds are coming through the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs okay uh, and that is it's coming through them and also a non-governmental organization and philanthropies okay good good uh, evaristo uh, yes uh in zambia um mm -hmm. the funding of funds are, are domiciled in the ministry of finance and national planning Mm -hmm. But the coordination of disasters are done through the Disaster Management and Mitigation Unit, which is mm -hmm. domiciled in the office of a vice president. So when the when the the, the, the disaster wing of government, mm -hmm. uh, which is represented at provincial level, district, and even at satellite level, does their assessment and they need some financing. So this is what now goes through the ladders until Minister of Finance releases the funds either to the province, to the to to, to the national level, or at whatever level the, the funds are very centralized, mm -hmm. they will come through the, the Ministry of Finance. Mm -hmm. So the funding, if if it's the state funds, they come through Ministry of Finance. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Then um, the flow of funds is okay. Whenever the funds come, like the flow, the flow of funds is is, is okay. Uh, it, it's based on the assessments that are done. Uh, mm -hmm. If if you are say you make an assessment and find that you need uh, so much, maybe you need five million dollars. That is okay. the amount that that the Ministry of Finance will release. Okay. so that is that is for but but if it's reconstruction mm -hmm. uh reconstruction will not the, the funds will not come directly through the, the the disaster wing of government but it will go to a reconstruction uh organization like if it's a road it will go to the road development agency okay yeah if it's a housing issue it will go through the the, the, the ministry of infrastructure and housing and and then those who undertake uh the, the, the actual work uh, on the ground or they will subcontract or they they, they, will, they will advertise for a contract for outsiders to bid okay yeah it's that is after obvious. after all the feasibility studies have been done on, mm -hmm. on what needs to be done taking into consideration all the things that we have talked about like climate change issues and taking into account the risk so that we don't have a recurrency of uh the, the same risk so we mainstream the risking plans so there must be a team that visits uh 
from various units which visits the, uh, the site or the place. Like we have here that a study team from the government visits from various sectors, important sectors like housing, agriculture to assess the damage. Yes, uh, there's a multi sectoral team that will do the assessment. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a team that will, the assessment is quite comprehensive mm -hmm. and it, it will touch different aspects and different sectors. Okay. Until you have something that is representative that will bring a reconstruction and recovery. Okay. Similar to something which we in India also we have. Yeah. And we have something like uh, the local representatives of that area. They also have some funds. Apart from these funds uh, from the central or the national level, we have another source of funding comes from the elected representative of that area. That elected representative has something, has a fund with it. We call it as local area development scheme. So from that also, some amount is earmarked to undertake immediate relief. And we have also Prime Minister's National Relief Fund from where the funds go. And the other important thing, another source of finance is insurance schemes. Though insurance schemes have not picked up much. I do not know in, if in your countries, disaster risk insurance has gained prominence. We have certain schemes in place, but still it has to pick up. Do you have any insurance yeah. schemes? So insurance is a very important aspect in finance, disaster finance. Because some countries, they have pool of pools also. The catastrophe pools, where you yes, ma'am, we have them, but not uh, they are not given as uh, important or as a much consideration as they're supposed to be given. We have them, but they are really not playing the role that they're supposed to play. Yeah. yeah, so insurance because insurance is one of the very important mitigatory measures that governments have to keep in view disaster risk insurance, like it is one of the key mitigation measures. So this is one important aspect. And the other is there are certain norms, like you know, whenever there is this uh, financial assistance which is given, there has to be some fiscal discipline which is to be maintained. Like you know, the resources are limited in nature. So when the funds are transferred, like for example, in India, we have the local at the local level, like whatever funds the discipline has to be maintained that whatever funds have been earmarked they should be actually utilized for the purpose for which it has been uh, asked for and each and all the states are responsible for being accountable for each and every amount that is spent so ensuring physical responsibility is also a very important aspect of this funding arrangements and the other is we have another important aspect is role of international agencies and donor agencies. It's like we all know that international agencies, whenever the disasters take place, they pitch in. Like, you know, World Bank, IMF, uh, United Nations, several organizations, Asian Development Bank, all these, they come up with the financial, this thing. But the thing is, one needs to ensure that the whatever funds are available, apart from it is being given for relief, they should also be channelized for creation of long-term reconstruction activities. Because reconstruction activities should lead to development of a strong, solid, physical, social, economic infrastructure. So it has to be seen that it is channelized and not just in fulfilling the immediate requirements of the people. No doubt meeting the immediate requirements of people in the form of clothing, temporary shelters, medicines is important. At the same time, the funds have to be utilized in a way that they create in developing or strengthening or building of solid infrastructure in the community. And the other important aspect is since everywhere we talk of the community, the community also 
has to be like you know there have to be efforts where some small amounts and some resources are pooled in by the community for resource generation because the resource generation community has to play an important role like for example in india we have examples where the local level the village panchayats and then they come forward and they participate in long term uh, reconstruction and rehabilitation activities. There have been cases where houses also have been built and check dams have been built with funds given by the local authorities. We have like panchayat, we call it panchayats, panchayat institutions. They also earmark their money from this. So because the basic idea is the community, it has, it knows its needs. And it has a, uh, like it can identify with the, what they need. And it is they that they can take decision for themselves. And then if the local bodies are able to help them in generate, in creating resources and giving them, like, you know, in India, we have something like self-help groups also. They also can pitch in and they are in some states, they are able to generate not much, but small meager amounts where, you know, some small, like, you know, something like shelter for livestock, some houses can be built. So all these where, you know, the labor comes from the village, the local masons and artisans, they come together and help in rebuilding. So after the Bhuj earthquake and later also, whenever the disaster struck, we had examples where, you know, we had cases where they came together and they utilized the local knowledge and pulled in the resources and then made a small impact in their community. I'm sure in your places also, the community, it is, an imp it is a difficult task because, you know, asking the community to generate resources for this huge task is difficult, but in a small way, they can be able to do. So in your countries also, you have anything where community also comes together Do they come to the, they do they come forward? Yes, yes, ma'am. They do come together. But the problem is that in regard to disaster, the community have less uh, uh, role to play. Hmm. Because all everything uh, pertaining uh, this disaster is taken care by the uh, federal government. So the community have uh, less role to play in it. But then you have uh, local well, government institutions. All what they are involved is our traditional rulers when it comes to any disaster. So our traditional rulers, our traditional leaders, they are the ones that know the people that are affected. So whatever they are going to be channeled to these affected people, this traditional ruler has to be uh, uh, taken into cognizance so as to maybe Serve as a ladder by the maybe donor organization and the government itself. So, Adamu? Yes, the, the root of the matter with the issue of Nigeria is that, you know, corruption has penetrated every corner and every sector. And when it comes to the issue of disaster management, relief fund, and the construction, actually, the central have hijacked virtually everything so to say because when there is disaster the local community at the beginning they don't even know much about the disaster plan they don't know about uh, the, the, the disaster mitigation plans and other things like that because there is no awareness the only thing that can government tell people is that there this there is likelihood of disaster in this particular area you need to evacuate and government will not be there to coordinate the evacuation neither enforce the evacuation so the people will feel reluctant and stay behind because there is no proper education and awareness until when the disaster strike and when the disaster strike now the government will come in to bring relief materials and that will also be coordinated as i have said earlier by the ministry of humanitarian affairs it is when they are coming that you will see maybe the, the senator representing that area will accompany them and also the, the, the director, SEMA of the state will be there 
and some of his executives. But virtually, is this uh, CBOs, uh, either relief group, a Red Cross, that you will see them rendering some services there with regards to health care. But apart from that, the community are very least involved in the activity of disaster management in this part of the world that we are living in. Because there is a disconnect. The fact that there is a law that uh, mm -hmm. that establish both the central, the local, the state, and the local. And there is been specified that in local, their committee will be chaired by the vice chairman of that local government. In the state, by the deputy governor. National, by the vice president. But you see all these things are there in papers. <laughs> central height and everything. Good. Ma. Yeah. 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 In addition to what, in addition to what Adam said, the problem is that the, most of the problem in Nigeria, in issue of disaster, in this issue of disaster is corruption. Corruption, corruption is the most highly, the, the most highly problem in terms of this yeah. disaster. It, for example, the relief of material, you will see a, a single, a single man will handle everything. He will not, he will not, he will not allow to release this sort of material, material to release uh, to. To reach to reach the people where uh, to reach the people that are affected by by the, affected by the people and likewise the issue of uh, uh how to uh, how can i put it the issue of uh when it comes up with the uh ngo to participate in this uh, disaster management people people do not allow uh, okay when they when when the relief material are released by this uh, uh, ngo and other local local uh, and other high people they will not allow. They will not allow to reach the, pe the people that are affected by this disaster. Mm. That is the pro That is the problem. The main, main problem in Nigeria that is corruption. You see a man hijack only one, only one, only one man hijack everything. That mm. is the problem. That's true. Evaristo. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, what my colleagues are talking about is almost uh, what is obtaining in, in, in different countries. So I, I, I want to appreciate the first lecture today uh, on vulnerability. So basically what you find is uh, organizational vulnerability. We, we still haven't developed the organization structures that are especially at local levels. For mm -hmm. us uh, in Zambia, uh, the provincial level is uh, at least quite functional and this is when we're trying to get the district on the satellite where, where we want to have it at village level to to have a system that works but there's no structure that you can rely on at, at both district and and village level and so when we go to that network when the entire network begins to work and operate effectively then the community will be quite well sensitized and then they will be able to, to to know that actually everything begins with them this time yeah maybe due to corruption like my colleagues are talking about it could be that uh, uh, people at the central level would want to to have the largest benefit and so they would want to impose uh, things and that's why we find things may not have been working but if we turn uh, everything and we strengthen the grassroots communities and we strengthen structures there the other issue is the political vulnerability where we have strong uh, political system that works leadership at local level that works that is able to demand and even at some point be able to even source for funds at community level then we'll see that the the, the, the disaster management paradigm at, at at the community level will become very functional that's my yeah, submission you are, yeah yeah absolutely very well put see these problems are there even in india also but we have a strong uh, local government institution like which has developed over the years and coupled with 
the legislation I was saying, the right to information, all these things. Now, the people are demanding the rights-based approach is gaining prominence. So the people's representatives also, they are playing a key role. They are, so they are, they are realizing their responsibility because they will be questioned. So it is slowly making a dent in the entire process. So as you said, corruption is a very yadam. Uh, you know, one of the major problems that we also have in Nigeria is that our local government do doesn't even have autonomy. Okay. As it is now, the documents are lying at the national legislature for them just to approve the local government to have autonomy. It is an issue mm. for more than 20 years now. That is the implication of that. A local government mm. administration cannot even build a road. Mm. They cannot even construct a bigger culvert. They don't have those funds. So they can only manage to pay salaries and other minor, minor things. So even the, 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 the fund for them, for their money, the allocation, that is to say the allocation, is not coming directly from federal government to the local government. It has to go to rural governors. They have what they call joint account. And in this joint account, Let's say if one million naira is allocated to a local government, a governor will decide what to give that local government. Maybe he may decide to give them 100,000 or 200,000, which can only maybe cater for their salary and nothing more. And that mm. makes them redundant. They cannot do anything. But that is one of the major problems. That is why disaster management at the local level will be very difficult because they don't even have yeah. the resources. Yeah, it's a major challenge. If somebody else wanted, I uh, want some, has some observation. Then we close for today. Then tomorrow we'll meet. Okay. Okay, Prof. Okay, because I think, because I think see. I don't think that you all know, like I'm really happy that you you know, all of you know so much about disaster management. So, you know, the discussion should be where, you know, that's why I think interaction helps in getting, I also come to know about your country. So, you know, this is a more this thing than, you know, you have the material, you can go through it. That's why I'm just touching the points and then you can have, that's why I'm making it more interactive. Okay? Okay. Okay, bro. Okay. Okay, then. Okay, bro. See you all tomorrow. Okay, 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 Thank you. Uh, that gives me, that encourages me. A teacher always, always it can't be a one sided thing. I get more. I also learn from you. Learning is a lifelong process. Okay. So we okay. don't. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. Happy Thank Sunday. We meet tomorrow. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. Ya haya munye kamu. Ava da. Munye kamu na kama na kama wa. To show you that I'm my I'm my I'm married. I'm not a single like you. I mean ah ya haya I have four kids. Ava da.